Commissioner Mella Anderson. Present. Commissioner Botel. Here. Also present, Attorney Smith Chris with Pittman Law Group. Jonathan Evans, CRA Executive Director. Scott Evans, Director of Planning and Development. Anita Jenkins, Director of Neighborhood Services. Shirley DeVere, Interim CRA Clerk. Thank you. If we can't have a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Dr. Botel. <laughs> We have any additions, deletions, or substitutions? None from staff, Mr. Chair. Disclosures by the council or staff? None. Motion to adopt? Second. Motion to be made and properly seconded, Madam Clerk. Yes. Commissioner Botel? Yes. Commissioner Mella Anderson? Yes. Chair Pro Temp Lanier? Yes. Chair Lawson? Yes. That vote passes four to zero. Consent agenda. Items on consent agenda are routine business in nature. Consent is approved by one single vote, and items may be removed at the discussion or the discretion of a commissioner. Does anyone want to remove an agenda, an item from consent? No. Motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Motion made and properly seconded. Madam Clerk, do we have any public comment cards on consent? No, Mr. Chair, we have no comment card. Thank you. Roll call, please, Madam Clerk. Commissioner Botel. Commissioner Miller Anderson. Yes. Chair Pro Temp Lanier. Yes. Chair Lawson. Yes. That vote passes four to zero. Okay. Discussion item CRA bylaw. CRA bylaw adding, adding to the bylaw procedures after an accusation of malfeasance. The acceptance of public comment cards are now closed. Mr. Chair, we have no comment cards. Thank you. Attorney Smith. The chair, <clears throat> at our last meeting, we um, developed a, a um, cause of action of malfeasance within the bylaws, but it was mentioned that there's no procedure uh, to deal with an accusation against a council person. I've been in contact with the city attorney, uh, Ms. Dawn Wynn, uh, because even on the city side, there was no procedure laid out. And just to let you know, you're not unique in this, in this situation. Um, I've met with the League of Cities. There's, no, there's not really any cities that have procedures laid out when a commissioner is accused of an offense. And so um, in working with the city attorney, we've developed a procedure to be adopted within the bylaws of the CRA and possibly to be adopted within the city um, and be presented by Ms. Wynn. What these procedures would do is if a commissioner, a council person is accused of malfeasance, and remember what we do, uh, describe as malfeasance in the bylaws is if a council person um, directly interferes with an employee of the CRA, if they um, are accused of being hostile to employees of the CRA, uh, that is a malfeasance. And so what this procedure would do would allow you to hire an independent investigator. We've described what an independent investigator has to be and put certain parameters. That investigator would then come back with a recommendation. Um, and we laid out certain recommendations, um, one through seven, um, but you can go beyond that. Now, the other, the last part, was language taken from language within your executive director's um, contract. It gives a chance for a public hearing even before the inspection. So again, if a council person is accused of something, that council person can then petition to the chair and then within 10 days have a public hearing to have themselves heard. The commission council can then still proceed with an inspector general, with an, with an investigation and go through the procedures. But it gives the council person a chance to be heard publicly even before the process start, if they want to. And that's the, that's the procedure we've developed. Um, um, the one thing that was brought up by uh, Council Person McCoy, um, I said that I did this in conjunction with the city and with the city, uh, you're under the, uh, you have an agreement with the inspector general. So the inspector general can 
Um, Palm Beach County um, has jurisdiction over the city, but the CRA, the Inspector General has no um, jurisdiction over the CRA. So within the bylaws on number six of the, um, of the procedures, we take out Office of Inspector General and put in agency after the word agency with jurisdiction deemed appropriate. So we just take out for our bylaws, we take out Inspector General um, and then you'd have to deal with how you want to do it on the city side if, if you agree to these. Thank you, Tony Smith. Comments from the board? Uh, What's up? Go ahead. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, I think that we need to have some examples of what constitutes direct interference. Um, you can have EG, but you have to give, I, I, people would have to know what that means because that can take on a, you know, tone where a person just had a misunderstanding or it could be something where there's physical contact. So how is that defined in terms of direct interference? Is that defined as talking, physical? I'm assuming it's all, but it needs to be some type of example of that. Sure. If you look above um, under Section 10A, it's the language we adopted last month. Um, and if you look halfway down, it is express intent of this provision that recommendations or suggestions for improvement for agency operations by individual commission members be made solely to and through the executive director. And so if uh, this is where we put examples. If you're seeking examples, we'd have to amend this part also, that language that we adopted last month. Tell me, tell me where you're reading from again. If you look at A, under Exhibit A. Okay. Um, when you look at A, the language that's underlined, that's the language that we're looking to add to the bylaws. The ununderlined language is language that we adopted last month, and that's in the bylaws now. If you look about... Um, oh, wait a minute. I got to pick... Our section is I'm, not I'm, underlined. I'm, I'm putting up the wrong thing here. Wait a second. I'm, I'm looking. It is underlined? No, mine's not either. No, I don't have anything that's underlined. I just have a regular one, two, a two pages of... Uh, yeah, I don't have anything that's underlined. But halfway down A is what he's talking about. Halfway yeah, he's down talking A. about A. But you, what were you talking about when you say underlined? Okay, well, section B and C, section B and down should all be underlined. That indicates that's what we're looking to add to the bylaws. It's not. I apologize if it's not in the packet underlined. No, I don't see it. So, we're, so we're, section A uh -huh. is, that's in the bylaws right now. That's okay. what we currently have is A. All right. B and below is what we're looking to add. But to answer your question, oh, I'm see. going back to A. And if you look at section, look at section A, um, look at about five, five lines down. This provision shall not prohibit um, advising appropriate agency personnel of the need for assistance with agency assigned computers or equipment is express intent. And down there is it tells what you can do. Okay. And that. Okay, that's fine. But this is this, you know, we, we talked about this because that is actually not just a bylaws uh, issue, but it is a charter issue. There's a charter that was um, adopted by this city in 2019. It said about the interference with employees and the city manager. So you need to look at that charter because there's some language in there that describes what that means. Um, yes, yes, that what that charter amendment does, because this is actually a charter amendment. It means that this body cannot interfere with the day-to-day -day operations of the city manager, CRA, executive director, meaning that we cannot individually tell them what to do. We cannot individually, but as a board, we can. So I think that the language of the, in the charter review has it much more clear then, um, and you might want to add something from that, but this is more than just the bylaws. This is a charter issue as well, because it states that in the charter that you cannot do what is being said here. Oops. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll go back and take, this is the language from the city's charter. Okay. This was taken directly from your charter. From that particular? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Section A was taken directly from your city's charter. Okay. The, by, the CRA does not have a charter. We just have the bylaws. And so right. we took the language from your charter and put in the bylaws. 
Yeah. And so what we're attempting to do now is to now put, okay, if it happens, what do we do? And that's section B, C, and, and below tells what you do if it's violated. Now, I can go back and look at, see if there are any examples in the chart. I don't believe there are, but I'll, I'm, I'll go back and look and see if there's subsequent language that we should add to section A. So when I do come back with a resolution, it has that subsequent language and the new procedures. Gotcha. Um, so what is the, what is it, what is, what is the specific criteria when it comes to or qualifications when it comes to an independent investigator? What does that mean? And, and, and how is that, how will they be selected? And, and how do we know that there are safeguards in place for impartiality? If you look at section C, it says the independent investigation investigator one shall not be employed by the city, by the Riviera Beach CRA or the city of Riviera Beach. Two, shall be licensed to practice law in the state of Florida. And three, shall have prior experience conducting investigation. That's under section, under section C, third line. We put out the criteria for an independent investigator. Okay, so how is that investigator selected? Who selects that investigator? The, the CRA director, the, the board. The committee, the board would select the board it. Would select it. Yes, the chair would put out. Will give the suggestion. You'd vote on who the investigator should be. I can spell that out more. Yeah, spell that out because yes, it, 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 it. I mean, we're not going to sit here and, and try and figure out who does that. I think that the CRA director should provide options or or a list of whatever and the city and the board chooses from that but there has to be a, an impartiality and it has to be who who picks it and how does that work so if the CRA director picks the five choices gives an explanation about each or background or whatever then that comes to the board okay. for the board to choose that way it's a great suggestion thank you mr mr chair if i may then go ahead uh, to the uh, to the councilperson's or the commissioner's point, um, we can do something like that. How we handle um, when we're dealing with unions as it relates to arbitrators, so we can bring that, and then you all can strike through um, those particular individuals. So we can provide a recommendation based on the discipline, based on the nature of what the inquiry is going to be, and then you all can make the determination as to whom you would like to facilitate the the arrangement. So that that's something that we have a common internal practice uh, with our labor union so we can bring that kind of uh, same time of format if in the event that this ever has to be activated. Okay, so so what I also want to happen is that there are uh, periodic reviews of this procedure to assess the effectiveness, the fairness. I don't wanna just put something together and then we leave it alone forever. It has to be, you know, once a year, twice, a, you know, every two years or whatever, it has to, have some type of review so that we know that these procedures are effective, that they're fair, if we have to use them. So right. there may be, you know, other changes that may come up as we move this along, but I want to make sure that that periodic review is a part of that. Um, so, if there are conflicts between what we have in the Florida Code of Ethics, how does that how is that conflict resolved? Are we using the Florida statute as the is the yes. example and the Florida ethics as example? How do how are we doing that? Yes, ma'am. On the line on the third line, and, and I, I apologize that it's not yeah, written in the packet. Yeah. Third line of section B. Um, is in no way intended to conflict with the provisions of the Florida Code of Ethics for public officers and employees. So the, the, the Florida Code of Ethics would supersede this. This is not to be in conflict with it. Okay, I just want to make sure that this is yes, clear, it is fair, and it is, it is, it is applied, you know, impartially, mainly because we never thought we would have to do this. Yes but we're in a position where we're going to have to set some boundaries for the behavior of members of the board. And with that being said, we want to make sure that 
if anybody's accused of anything, that they have the option and they have the wherewithal to have a hearing and to be heard about whatever is being said about them. Thank you, Brother Sam. Yeah. Dr. Woods up? Good. You good? What is good. Thank you, Attorney Smith. So, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, well, do we need a resolution to move this forward? And that, um, Dr. Patel, that's what I want to get at. So, I'll take these um, comments and develop a resolution for next month for you okay. to act on, including the comments by the uh, Vice Chair and incorporating those. And return next month with a resolution. Thank you, Attorney Smith. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you. 7A. Resolution number 202407, approving an amendment to the interlocal agreement between the Rivera Beach Community Redevelopment Agency and the City of Rivera Beach for underground utility conversion by Rivera, Florida Power and Light and Roadway Enhancement by the Florida Department of Transportation. The acceptance of public comment cards are now closed. Mr. Chair, we have no comment cards. Motion. Motion to approve resolution number 202407. Second. Motion remains properly seconded. Ms. Evans. Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I can have the Director of Planning and Development, Mr. Scott Evans, to make this presentation. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. This item, um, this amendment to the interlocal agreement uh, the, is to allow the Florida Department of Transportation uh, to upgrade some of the um, roadway enhancements that they're planning to make in the US-1 Broadway corridor. Uh, under their project, they're proposing to enhance the lighting at the intersections uh, at um, all along the Broadway corridor in Riviera Beach. And the way the department works is those li new lights that they're proposing to be added, they would be the standard uh, lights that they utilize on all uh, the, the state roadways. Uh, we already have decorative lighting installed on Broadway, so this change would upgrade uh, the lighting that's going to be added, uh, which we think is great, uh, providing more illumination along the roadway, um, but it would upgrade them to the existing type of poles, which is a decorative pole that's already uh, in the corridor. And the other change is, as a part of repaving the roadway, um, they would replace the asphalt. And we have existing um, decorative uh, stamped, um, stamped asphalt, which is a colored type crosswalk, which provides a nice decorative look. Um, and, in or and we don't want, uh, so that this would add additional dollars to that project so that we can retain those decorative crosswalks at 13th Street, at Blue Heron, and would install decorative ones at 22nd Street. So the um, amendment is, there's an interlocal funding agreement between the city and the CRA for work along the US-1 corridor for the utility burial. And this would add $313,212 um, $212, uh, which is the estimated cost by FDOT uh, to upgrade those crosswalks and the lighting to decorative so that we can maintain uh, that, that nice look along the Broadway corridor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Questions from the board? Yes. Pro Tem, go ahead. Um, you know, we talked about this, uh, Mr. Evans, over the <clears throat> agenda review and the timeline because, as I said before, I've been hearing about the underground utility since I've been here. And I know that it is a process, and I understand that there's, um, when you explain to me that there's the underground piece and then there's the surfacing piece, and, you know, but we need to get a timeline and a presentation that number one says where we are and then number two gives us an idea of where it's going to when it's going to end when it'll be finished um i know that involves fpnl that involves uh fdot but i'm sure that you can make it where we can have a presentation to know exactly where we are because it has been going on a long time and i know that they'll say you know we'll get back to you because it is fpl is ftot <laughs> but we do need to hold them to a timeline so that, you know, another five years don't pass. Mr. Chair. Mr. Evans, go ahead. Uh, um, yes, we will, we have been uh, discussing uh, the need to have a specific timeline for this project as it progresses. Uh, they have provided some feedback, but we will follow up to ask them 
to bring a formal uh, presentation to this board. Uh, the City Council and the CRA completed the agreements with FPL in September. Um, so I think uh, we've been waiting quite a while for that schedule and we will request that they make that presentation to this board. Um, I want to know what is the, what are the um, measures that you're taking to minimize the impact to the businesses in that area? The permitting is is done by FPL and FDOT. Um, obviously, roadway construction has has impacts. Um, so we, I, because they are managing those portions of the project, this will come back uh, before you. The funding allows the city to then enter into a local funding agreement, which would be with the Department of Transportation. Um, so we could, and they are fully prepared uh, to present uh, to the city council and if you would like to this board, uh, how they plan to approach that project. Right now, we're providing them uh, the funding uh, commitment so that they can finish the design plans because they're still in the design phase of the project. Um, and so by providing that funding commitment, they will complete the design plans to include the decorative items we're requesting. Uh, but as a part of the implementation, when they actually go to reconstruct the road um, and to tear up um, any other of the existing utilities to make these improvements, um, we can have a, uh, them do a presentation on how they're going to address those businesses. And then two, how, once they're done, and let's hope that's sooner rather than later, who is responsible for the maintenance of it? The, Mr. Chair. Sounds good. Um, the maintenance of the decorative crosswalks that get installed would be uh, under a maintenance agreement with the uh, city through Public Works Department, who would bring that to you to the city. That's required in uh, under in all the cities that elect to do decorative. The maintenance of the uh, the the underground facilities that would be. Um, Florida Power and Light would have to maintain their own facilities as they do with the overhead. And so the resurfacing, resurfacing of the streets is something, or the lights is something that we do, or DOT does? I mean, because you, you, we're looking at long term, what happens after that? So is, what, is, what is that? We do the lights in terms of keeping the maintained, the decorativeness of it, and the resurfacing, is that done by FDOT? Yes, the resurfacing is done by FDOT, uh, but the maintenance for that stamped asphalt is does um, fall on the city. Um, I don't think that the city is responsible for going and fixing it if there's a is a problem, but we do have to work with FDOT uh, if there was an issue with the decorative. And uh, as for the lighting, um, that is something that I would have to have the Public Works Department uh, advise the city council on. Okay, because I mean, it's taken a long time to get it done. So once it's done, we just want to make sure that it stays looking like it's supposed to. Um, and that's the difference between, you know, having a long-term maintenance plan and, you know, just doing it and then that's it. Um, I think we got into that trouble in the city and then our water plant, you know, just build it and then that's it there is no maintenance to it and now things are falling apart so we want to ensure that these roads and these lights and how decorative they're going to be who's going to maintain them and how that's going to be done in conjunction with the city thank you President. this is comments from the board Ms. Evans, uh, we spoke in our agenda review as well. Um, one of the biggest concerns is that noticing and update of the businesses and the residents in that area. Uh, just last week, I probably received 10 calls, emails, and messages of Facebook because roads were shut down because they were changing a, a pylon, a FPNL uh, pillar. We weren't properly noticed to the residents because I don't think we were noticed. So I just want to make sure that clear communication with having the charrettes, but then also advising of that work schedule so that no residents or businesses are impacted when that's being done. Um, we have residents over there in that on Broadway corridor that are gonna have to go and di find different routes of getting home and going around when they're actually doing that work. So proper noticing and making sure it's clear and 
figuring out why the ball was dropped. I know Mr. Jonathan Evans is going to work on that for me, but what happened last week, why if, you know, was just doing work in our city without having it properly noticed and permitted. So, Mr. Evans, sure. go ahead. Yeah, if, if I may, with with respect to the, the maintenance of the lights, usually when there is a decorative light um, fixture that the city asks for, uh, that maintenance requirement does you know, fall on the city as it relates to to those particular issues. But we have to look specifically to that roadway because it may be different. Um, we did have uh, conversations with FPL's representatives. FPL actually contracted out with Pike to come in and do some improvements and Pike pulled their permit from the county and it didn't require any notification to in fact the city and the FPL representatives didn't know that. And so we have since made contact with representatives from Pike and they are doing work throughout our community and they're making sure that there is adequate ingress, egress on the roadways in our city. Also, we are setting a, um, on your April, I believe 17th, uh, regular city council agenda, representatives from FPL will be here. Uh, we did communicate our expectations to be informed with regards to any work being done in the community. So I don't think that there's going to be a, a mishap as it relates to that in the future. Uh, but we have uh, made contact with the crews and they should be finished with their work throughout our city uh, on Friday. But they are doing some improvements to some of the distribution lines in the city. And when was that meeting with that peanut? When are they coming? Uh, that's going to be your second meeting in April. They're coming April. to make a presentation to the board. Thank you, sir. And the last but not least, Mr. Scott Evans, the um, working in conjunction with uh, arts beautification of the corridor, seeing what we can work with with development services uh, when we actually do the enhancements to seeing how we can really just make it a, a big bang like we talked about in our gender review. So those are my concerns I just wanted to discuss. Board members, commissioners, anything else? No? Madam Clerk? Commissioner Botel? Yes. Commissioner Mella Anderson? Yes. Chair Pro Temp Lanier? Chair Lawson? Yes. That vote passes four to zero. Thank you. 7B. Resolution number 202409, approving an amendment to the application and the process of the commercial grant and signage grant incentive program. The acceptance of public comment cards are now closed. Mr. Chair, we have no comment cards. Motion to approve resolution number 202409. Second. Motion remained properly seconded. Mr. Evans? <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I have the director of planning and development, Mr. Scott Evans, to make this presentation. Mr. Chair, Sense. thank you. Um, this is an amendment to the existing commercial and signage grant program. Uh, this was discussed at our previous CRA board meeting. Um, we have prepared it tonight for, uh, for your consideration. The signage and commercial grant program would, under this change, be continue to be approved in the CRA's annual budget process, which is um, approved by the board. The regulations that govern the commercial grant program and the signage program would remain the same. The change would be that individual applications would uh, be reviewed administratively rather than each business owner waiting for the item to come on the CRA's uh, board agenda. Uh, as long as they met all of the requirements of the program um, and they completed their application um, in that manner, they would be able to be reviewed um, and receive approval or denial uh, based on those regulations uh, and under an administrative process. And applications would only be approved that are uh, utilizing the amount of dollars that the board approves for the program. Once those dollars are used, uh, are used up in commitment <coughs> to commercial grant owners, we would then bring it back before this board. And um, we would also look to provide some uh, reporting to the board um, throughout the year uh, in order to keep you up to date on this, the status and progress of those applications. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Do we have any public comments? Here we have no comment cards. Just if, I, if I could have an update on what's happening with the grants to the businesses on Singer Island, I'd appreciate it. And I, I agree that this is something that really should be handled administratively and doesn't have to come before this body. But I would like to know what's going on with the Singer Island grants. Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Evans, go ahead. I believe we're working, um, we don't have any active applications for grants for projects on Singer Island. We are uh, speaking 
with some um, uh, future businesses who would like to move there. We're also talking to a couple of different property owners uh, who are considering signage um, and perhaps some uh, facade improvements. Um, so we, we, we try to be responsive. Uh, we don't have any pending applications under review uh, for that area. However, uh, we are in active discussions with uh, at least two or three different uh, properties. Great, thank you. Mr. Evans, my, I'm sorry, what's up? No? Uh, just a couple of questions. Please go about, ahead. I thought we were going to have a public comment first. No, we didn't have any. We have public no comment. Comments. Okay. So this is my question, too. I think I've asked this before. Um, I know that the signage is used to create, quote unquote, beautification, um, to spur business. And my questions are always what are the outcomes for this? How do we measure success? How does this billboard or this facade bring business in? How do we measure that? How do we know it's, it's successful? Because it's just more than just putting up a sign. It's, it's trying to spur business. That's the purpose, right? So how do you measure that success? And then on top of that, what are the uh, sustainability measures? How do, you, how do you make sure that if you gave someone with a match $150,000, to do facade change and to do a nice sign on front of their business. What is the maintenance plan for that? Is that something that the city helps them with? Is that something that, because if not, you know, you give this money and then in five years, you know, it looks a mess. But if there's some maintenance plan as an agreement, then that's something that probably can last 15 years versus five. So I'm, I'm just trying to get some idea because I'm thinking, you got to think ahead in terms of how this is going to look in five years. Or 10 years mr chair i think that it certainly is challenging to measure the what's readily available is before and after um the idea these grants are small so they're they're designed to make incremental small improvements to the area to change the overall look and feel uh like for us for you know whether it's repainting a building uh, replacing the windows or adding landscaping, fixing up a parking lot. Um, because of the size of the grant, um, they're really just trying to facilitate small changes um, to try and attract larger long-term developments that might happen as the area um, sort of changes its overall view and appearance. The signage program was specifically written um, through a consultant working with Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council to promote uh, businesses if they're going to access that money to create sign and signs that uh, do a better job of either attracting attention for the people who are driving by um, or to promote whatever product it is that they're trying to sell um, what we've noticed a lot of businesses try to have the biggest sign possible or pack the most words or information on their signs and that actually in the end uh, works against those businesses that less is more sometimes if you're trying to get people to see something and remember it. So the, the program does require that businesses put up a certain type of sign. Um, measuring that impact of that sign I think is difficult uh, as far as economics of that particular business. But the hope is that overall it would change the look of the corridor and provide a higher quality um, uh, not only signage and opportunity for the businesses to get people to notice them, but also uh, just to, to improve the look of each business individually. Chair. Pro temp, go ahead. Um, uh, another question is, does the city, the CRA provide any advice or assistance in terms of what the sign should look like? Because some people, they may have a business, but they may use the wrong font on the sign, or they the sign may be you know, not readable. Is there, is there any kind of guidance and um, help that you provide to the business owners? Yes, yes. Any any um, applicant who applies for our signage program, uh, we will sit down with them and go through the guidebook. Uh, and the guidebook talks about font, uh, sizing of letters, um, the amount of clear space, uh, the materials you build the sign with the look of the sign um, and the type of lighting that's used. So yes, we um, it's a fairly 
lengthy guidebook. So we sit down with anyone who wants to build a sign to talk talk about what we're trying to achieve with those guide guidelines. Okay, could you send that to me? I want to see how it looks. I, I think I've ever, I've ever seen it before. Um, that's it. Thank you. Back up. Okay. Additional comments, commissioners? And Mr. Evans, my only uh, feedback is that if we can get uh, either quarterly or every six months updates to the board just to discuss the program, because I know it's going to be done administratively, but I know we're going to want to see progress before the end of the year, before budget cycle. So maybe just a brief uh, dialogue every, I think the board will make the decision if we'll do six months or three months, just to kind of get an update on where we are, what's been presented, how the dollars have been implemented, um, pretty pitches would help, and so maybe some testimony. Okay. Additional comments? Madam Clerk. <clears throat> Commissioner Botel? Yes. Commissioner Mella Anderson? Yes. Chair, Chair Pro Temp Lanier? Yes. Chair Lawson? Yes. That vote passes four to zero. Thank you. 17. Resolution number 202408, authorizing the execution of an agreement with Creative Contracting Group. ENF Florida Enterprises to not exceed $143,900 with a contingency of $14,390 for unforeseen circumstances to renovate and refresh the Marina Event Center. Authorizing the chairman and executive director to take such actions as, such as shall be necessary and consistent to carry out the intent and desire of the agency providing an effective date. The acceptance of public comment cards are now closed. Mr. Chair, we have one comment card. Motion approved resolution number 202408. Made, do we have a second? Motion made and properly seconded. Ms. Evans? Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I can have the Director of Neighborhood Services, Ms. Anita Jenkins, to make this presentation. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, Mr. Chairperson, if I may. Um, last month, we gave an initial presentation about a process to refresh the main elements in the event center, the flooring and the walls, as well as the uh, painting outside, interior, exterior painting. The city's procurement department assisted us with releasing a request for bids to approve contractors on the city's list. Uh, seven companies were invited to bid one company returned a proposal. And before you tonight is a request to approve that co company creative concepts for a bid not to exceed $143,900 with a 10% contingency for unforeseen circumstances. And I'll see if there are any questions. Thank you. Uh, public comment card, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. Chair, we have one public comment card, Margaret Shepard. Welcome, Ms. Shepard. Welcome, Mr. Chair, to everybody in a respectful place. As I hear you all keep talking about refresh, I'm trying to figure out refresh what. I heard her talk about it last week, but you know, that bathroom and that need to be refresh. Outside, I think over the rotunda where the paint is coming out needs to be refreshed. To me, outside where Ricky Tiki is at and they got all that stuff and gobbly goop. I mean, it's embarrassing you come in there to uh, have a whatever and you look down and that place out there is filthy. I think you're talking about refresh. All this carpet needs to go because when we have our uh, events here, stuff is spilling everywhere on these, uh, this carpet. The chairs, filthy. I, I just don't know how. I mean, I could tell they've been clean a little bit, but they need professional cleaners because when you go to other people events and I know you've been at events in this their lots because I you know, you know I just see it and I, I see the interior of uh, where you at and it's beautiful to come here for me it's like a, a, a cut down so I think when you're talking about refresh do it right do it right make us proud where we at we come here for everything Funerals, weddings, whatever. 
And when you talk about refresh, it makes me sound like you're gonna patch up something. I mean, take a professional, paint the whole building, make it nice. The, 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 resident, the residents are paying their taxes going out their door. It should be nice. When you walk in, it should be a wow factor. It's no wow factor coming in that door. It's just utterly uh, somewhere you go, somewhere you put up with. But I've been at, I've been, I've been at different places, Mr. Lawson, and I know you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely beautiful. This is not beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for coming. How much from the board? Um, I just Pro have time. one comment, and this probably does not um, have anything to do with Ms. Jenkins. The issue I have is that the last CRA meeting, we were talking about giving the event center, quote unquote, uh, to a separate entity to be able to manage. Now, my question is, if 275000 was budgeted for it, how do we get our money back? CRA chair, no, CRA director. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yep, go ahead. So um, a, a couple of ways. Um, obviously, we have an opportunity by virtue of, of getting into a discussion with uh, the developer to recoup some of the investment that the CRA has undertook um, as part of whatever the negotiations would be. Uh, but that particular um, transition, if the board is inclined to support that, is probably at minimum at least five years away um, before that particular um, arrangement would be would be consummated. So uh, there's significant uh, time between when that relationship would have. But I, I would say as a subject of negotiation and things that the city or that the CRA would, would invest, obviously, uh, there are some uh, monies that can be recouped. But in all actuality, when we looked at the overall uh, plan to improve this event center and the surrounding properties, to there is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of investments that need to occur in this particular space and even the exterior space to the tune of probably a million dollars when you look at both inclusive of the indoor and outdoor spaces. Um, so those are all subject of negotiations, but we certainly will want to recoup up some of our invest in, investment at whatever the depreciated value is. But we we don't want to have a situation whereby the facility continues to deteriorate because we haven't invested in the upkeep and maintenance. But we will try to recoup the cost that the city would or that the CRA would put into this space as best as we possibly can. Okay, that that sounds okay. But I just want to make sure that because if you're in talks to give this thing to someone else, but then you're over here spending money on it, there has to be somewhere that the city is just not spending money to give it to somebody else. So what I want to happen is that there needs to be um, negotiation in terms of recouping some of this money because it, it certainly needs it. Um, and I have no problem with that. It's just the fact that if you're in talks to give it to someone else and then you're over here spending money, then it needs to be some type of reconciliation with that. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, certainly the board has a lot of um, leverage in the relationship right now. And I think when that does come back before you all, I think that's a conversation to say, hey, the, the CRA would like to be provided for compensation at a depreciated value of the investments it makes in the space or if you make the investments in this particular space, we need to see if it's like for like or something that we're okay with that we can give you credit for that. But that's something that can be as part of the relationship that I think the board can push back on. And I, and I don't think it would be met with any opposition from those parties that are interested in it. I right, thank you, Chair. Thank you. There's no comments from the board. I would be um, in agreement with our, our speaker, Ms. Shepard. We've, uh, I've seen her in many uh, beautiful places, and you want to make sure that this is as grand as possible. If somebody wants to host a wedding, a reception, um, a retirement party, a birthday party, we want to beautify this place. So if we're going to put the dollars into it, I want to make sure that it just it shines. Even with uh, transitioning to a management company coming in, until that time frame happens, nothing has been done in the marina for about 
eight, nine years since we opened up. So we have to at least upkeep it so we can continue to sustain it because there's no guarantee. We, we've we been working on the same contract for us. My pro temp will say years. So there's no guarantee it'll be. Thank you. Thank you, pro temp. <laughs> but there's no guarantee it'll be done within a certain time frame. So while we do have it, we want to maximize on the rental and beautification of this. So uh, I want to be able to go out with Ms. Shepard and have a beautiful time in a beautiful building. So those are the things that we're looking for. So I would agree with her. Uh, additional comments? Madam Clerk. Commissioner Botel. Yes. Commissioner Miller Anderson. Yes. Chair Pro Temp Lanier. Yes. Chair Lawson. Yes. That vote passes four to zero. Thank you. Comments from the public and we'll begin at 7:30. Um, they shall begin at 7:30 unless there's no further business of the city commissioner, which in the event it shall begin sooner. In addition, if an item is considered at 7:30, then comments from the public shall begin immediately after. Please be reminded the CRA Board of Commissioners has adopted rules of decorum, giving public conduct over official meetings, which has been posted at the front desk. In an effort to preserve order, if any of the rules are not adhered to, the chair may have any disruptive speaker or attendee removed from the podium, from the meeting, or from the building. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Madam Clerk, how many public comments cards do we have? Mr. Chair, we have four public comment cards. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Anna Vernia, followed by Margaret Shepard. Welcome, Ms. Anna. Um, I just, I'm Anna Bergen and I live at Lakeview Park. Our, we're still struggling. You can't breathe the air, you can't walk the streets. That problem continues and the machinery at Rybovich is going to kill one of us. I sent an example of that to Mr. Evans, but the, I keep coming here and I keep saying it, it's insignificant if we're not doing something about it. Um, I, we talk about malfeasance. That's a that's strong word. Um, but when we talk about that, we should also talk about nonfeasance, the failure to act when you know you have a duty to act. I, I looked at some of the bills in regards to the CRA, and I looked at some of the bills for this city, and they're be out of control. And I'll just give you an example of that. Um, we talk about malfeasance is an act that is illegal and causes physical or monetary harm to someone else. Paying $45 for a poinsettia hurts my pocket. And I think everybody in this city would agree to that. Now, that's just an example of what stands out to me, but I can give you plenty more. And it's disturbing. You guys have a duty to act. When I tell Mr. Evans, I expect him to act. Um, the, I, I, I also have a discussion with Mr. Evans regarding hostile work environment. I've seen it. I've, I've, I've reported it. I've personally seen it. I personally put it in writing. Mr. Evans needs to handle it. And I'm not picking on Mr. Evans. I know he has a million things to do. I just, after three years, I just need it handled. Um, I wanted to congratulate um, Ms. Lanier, Councilwoman Lanier. Thank you for making me feel welcome at your meeting. It was a great meeting. There were a lot of interesting and wonderful people, the police department, um, the ambassadors are great for my community, um, but the Reimagining Community Task Force, thank you for taking that on. Thank you for moving that forward. And thank you for having other people from other communities be able to participate. Thank you. That was wonderful today. Thank you for coming, Smith. Margaret Shepard, followed by J.P. Dixon. Welcome back, Ms. Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to everyone. Mr. Evans, before you leave, could I have like 10 minutes with you, sir? Thank you. Um, to the honorable chair and to all of you, uh, I first want to thank Mrs. Uh, Dr. Botel for 
uh, interceding with a problem on 23rd Street, my street. And although she's in limbo, um, I still had to reach out. And uh, here's uh, Major Gordon and code enforcement and oh God, uh, public works, everybody. I think we're, I think we're there. We're there. I think we have a few more things to do. And I think the major, he's kind of got it. And I thank him. Um, code enforcement. This is a what is his name? last name was. I bet not call it Johnson. I can't think his name. But anyway. He, uh, when I called him back, he says, what else, what else, what else, what else, Ms. Shepherd? And I said, I'm coming up there, I want to see it. So I kind of got a loop of what's going on. So I do thank you, uh, Dr. Wotel, and I know things are going very uh, erratic for you. Um, Ms. Liz, thank you for that little meeting, kind of cleared my mind a little bit. I hope I can meet with you again to kind of get a feel. Um, I found out through different people, you have to get a feel of people. I know I'm not the easiest person to get along with, but I try to be. But most of all, as the races are going on, I do want to, uh, to you, Ms. Miller Anderson, and to you, Dr. Botel, and uh, to everybody, this to me is one of the best races I've ever seen. I just want to see how it's going to work out. When people call me and they say they want a younger crew, when how you got a crew coming in, that's going to challenge an incumbent. And I want to say to you, this is a good fit. I think that being the statesman that you are, I think this would affect this young man to affect other people to come and run for these seats. So I'm sitting back, I'm laying back, I'm taking my phone calls, Zoom, and everybody's talking about it, how great this race is. So I want to give my extended hand to you, however go out or however come in, I still make sure that I respect everybody. Whether Mr. Spirit is getting in or uh, Leroy get in, I still hold the respect that whatever the vote is, I'm very good with it. So I want to say to you, thank you for your services. Thank you for all you do. Sometimes I don't agree with you, but the one thing I do, I do not try to turn your head to see it my way. I realize, and I say it every day on planning zoning, we give our opinions, but it's up to the council to give their opinions. And with that, I listen to your opinions, try to say, okay, see if it works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But once again, I give my hand to you guys in the election. I do wish you well. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Mr. Shepard. J.B. Dixon, followed by Mary Brown. <clears throat> J.D. Dixon, Singer Island in Riviera Beach. I came up here to speak about the signage system, <clears throat> but now that Ms. Shepard has brought up the election, I wish to remind everyone that Dr. Botel's case is pending before the Supreme Court of Florida, and that people are still eligible to vote for her because the ballot has her name on it. And although those votes will not determine the election, they will be tallied and will be available for us to gather and report after the election. So I would urge any of you who wish to vote for Dr. Botel instead of her opponent to do so and know that your votes will be counted, just not reported. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the signage system. I think that that is probably crucial to improving the aesthetic appearance of Riviera Beach, particularly since obviously the funds are very low. Those sections between Broadway and the bridge on both the north and the south side <clears throat> have a variety of really crummy looking signs for little businesses and they're all different and they're you know they're they're just bad looking and they make the place look bad looking so i think that we should invest or the cra should invest as much money as it needs to be including telling those business owners that they will pay to change their signage so that it looks like a good area. And in every good area around here, 
there, there is consistent signage for businesses. Otherwise, it really looks like a hood. And I think that we deserve better than that. And it's not only the businesses between Broadway and the bridge, but the businesses after the bridge and before North Ocean Drive that also look extremely tacky, just tacky. And we should really insist on uniform, uniform signage there. Thank you. Mary Bram. Good evening, board, and good evening to the community, because Ms. Bram definitely have been working you, and most of all, you have been working yourself. I have here two signs here. One says, I believe, and I love Rivera Beach. The other says, vote. Rivera Beach, you are asked to get up and vote. And in this stage and era, voting is the most crucial thing that you can ever, ever do now, because it depends on you. Everyone that I talked to on yesterday, and Ms. Bram get a lot of telephone calls, but I thank you all. This month is Women's Month, so I'm going to give a kudos to Ms. Louise Bowie. I am a recipient of Ms. Louise Bowie Shiro Award. Great leader, great advocate. Only stood, stood four feet in some county in stature, but she was powerful. Am I right? Am I wrong? She made great strides, not just in Rivera Beach, but all over the municipalities. And also a great shout out to Howard University, HBC University, skate ring team women. They made history. And it's all on the news and everywhere. I was up in Martin County yesterday, so you know, I do travel, I do get around. But it is some things here about those bonds. We need to resist, we need to get up and vote for those bonds there. You are going to get new schools in this city here. And it's not just about the parks. It is about making everything in an adequate facility for these schools that we will participate in. I think I'm just about tired explaining these bonds here. Don't vote for Ms. Graham. Get up and vote for your city. Vote for your city. It was made mention about Dr. Botel as well as the police station and the fire station as well. We need these things in this city here because this is why they're coming in this city here to build. And some is going to come down from Martin County, and they want to be a part of this city as well. And we must move and get this city built up from where it is now. That is the only way that you will ever make progress in here. Forget about, uh, forget about back there then. And wisdom does count. Everybody talk about Ms. Miller Anderson and Dr. Botel. Even in Washington, D.C., Whereas the age limit, but they're still talking about that wisdom. Great articles have been written here and published all over. But residents, you will make that decision. So, Ms. Bram, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Let's through. move on. Thank you. Oh, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Comments from the executive director, Ms. Evans. Attorney? None, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Attorney Smith. Committee reports? Comments from the board commissioners, starting with Ms. Miller Anderson? None. Ms. Linnea? Um, yeah, I have a couple of things. Tonight, uh, to, well, today, we had a very uh, informative and uh, very promising meeting with the community in Inlet uh, City and in, um, what's the other one name? Harbor? Well, near the firehouse. Um, the meeting was excellent in terms of trying to work out how to improve our neighborhoods. We know that aesthetically pleasing 
streets and neighborhoods decrease crime. And we're trying everything that we can to be able to help the police department in decreasing crime in our neighborhoods. Um, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at the Brook Center as well, we will have the first initial interest meeting for anyone who was interested in being a part of the city's education committee. 20, 30 years ago, the city had an education committee that was a very strong body that made recommendations to the school board and recommendations to the city council. The, 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 the committee is so important at this juncture, given um, we're on the road to a new high school in the city of Rivera Beach, and we want to make sure that the kindergarten kids and the first graders and the middle school kids, the high school that they're going to, that they are prepared because now we can walk and chew gum at the same time because even though we're getting a new high school, we need to make sure that we look at the schools that we have right now and what is happening in those schools and the low testing scores. So that is something that you can come out to tomorrow. And also I want to make sure that um, a part of this agenda tonight was about behavior and about making sure that if you're a board member, if people elect you to office, that there is a certain decorum that you have to maintain. And what happens is that if that is not maintained, it's not about if I like you, I don't like you. It is the fact that people will look at these meetings and look at the antics of this city and don't bring any money to the city. And we have to make sure that it's not something that is personal. We cannot have these kind of antics and these kind of things happening in the city. And we have all these things going on. We got, we got a new police department, new city hall. We have things and we finance and bond. That's money. And we cannot let anything get in the way of trying to do what we came here to do and what you elected us to do in this city. And shout out to Kishama Miller Anderson and Dr. Botel because they are the backbone and helping us to ensure we stay on track with what we're doing here in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Botel. Mr. Botel? Reiterate what um, Ms. Bram had to say. I'm so happy she raised two issues that are so important to me. Number one, thank you, Ms. Bram, for showing up in your emerald green. I love it. And happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. I will be in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Palm Beach Shores, as I do every year, and always happy to support them over there in Palm Beach Shores. I love that parade. Uh, and second, she mentioned the bonds. It's so important that we pass all three of those bonds, absolutely for the police and fire, but also for the parks. We could not be happier about the decision to have our own Riviera Beach High School. And that parks referendum will help us with the athletic facilities for that a new high school. So it's really important that people come out and pass those bonds. Um, I think that was it. Thank you again, Ms. Bram, for reminding me about St. Patrick's Day. Have a good evening. Thank you. And um, just comments tonight that uh, myself and Mr. Evans will be um, on Facebook Live, social media, talking about the bonds, giving clear direction, just giving insight to the bonds. So uh, anybody that's watching, please make sure you guys tune in. It'll be on social media tonight. So with no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Yay, good one. Good one. Huh?